happen this morning. They're all, it's always an opportunity for us to determine in our own hearts what we believe about God and what we believe about His Son. Today is Good Shepherd Sunday. One of my favorite Christian singers is Fernando Ortega. Fernando Ortega has written a, a, a song entitled The Good Shepherd and it goes like this, it's very simple. But he says, I am the good shepherd, I lay down my life for you. Enter in. I am the good shepherd as the Father knows me, I know you, and no one can take you away. And then he shifts and says, from our perspective, you are the good shepherd, you lay down your life for me. Enter in. Enter in. You are the good shepherd as the Father knows you, you know me, and no one can take you away. Enter in. Enter in is the title of my sermon this morning. As we talk about this relationship that we share with the Good Shepherd. If you have your Bibles, turn to the Gospel of John chapter 10. John chapter 10 and we will look together at verses 22 through 30. The first point in my sermon is a point that I have never in 30 plus years of preaching had as a sermon point. The point is, it was winter. It's not a very compelling point. It's probably not even a really important point. But when I read this passage again this week, I was struck by the way John wrote the beginning of this passage. At the time of the Feast of Dedication, took place at Jerusalem, it was winter. And Jesus was walking in the temple in the colonnade of Solomon. When I read those two verses, it, it, I don't know why, but it just hit me. It just hit me that we've got a scripture, a, a Bible, a holy book, the Word of God, that sometimes just shares things that are delightful. It's just delightful. It was winter. And Jesus was walking on Solomon's porch in the temple. It was winter in Jerusalem. To be specific, because we know the Feast of Dedication, it was the last week of December. December in Jerusalem is in the middle of the rainy season. But the temperatures are usually comfortable. It was during the Feast of Dedication. The feast was a celebration of the rededication of the temple which had taken place about 164 BC after it had been desecrated for several years by, by Antiochus Epiphanes. The feast was a joyous event Jesus was walking through one of the covered court areas called Solomon's Porch when the religious leaders surrounded him. No doubt in the excited spirit of the festival, and they said to Jesus, how long are you going to hold us in suspense? If you are the Messiah, tell us plainly. When I was a little boy, I was a part of Royal Ambassadors, which is kind of a Baptist uh, Boy Scout group. I think the, the Assembly of God had Royal Raiders or something like that, but we would get together every Wednesday night and we would do stuff, and usually every year, a couple of times a year, we would go camping. Now, I'm not a big camper. My father wasn't a big camper. But my father owned a furniture store when I was a boy, and he had a big box truck that we delivered furniture in. And so the way we roughed it, my dad and I, when we went camping was, we took the box truck and parked it at the campsite and slept in the back of the box truck. Looking back on it, 
Lots of folks wanted to sleep in the box truck with us. <laughs> but on those camping trips, you've, you've probably done this. When I was little, they always wanted to take the younger boys snipe hunting. Anybody ever been snipe hunting? Yeah. Well, what you need to know is that snipe don't exist. And so it was just a, a hazing tactic for older boys to be cool. Because I know that because when I was an older boy, I too was cool. And I took younger boys snipe hunting. I say that to you to say this about this passage. The religious leaders were snipe hunting. They were looking for something that did not exist. So the Jews gathered around him and said to him, How long will you keep us in suspense? If you are the Christ, tell us plainly. The Messiah was the long-awaited king who would come and reign over Israel. He would smash their enemies with a rod of iron and establish an eternal kingdom of peace and righteousness. He would finish the work begun by Judas Maccabeus at the original Feast of Dedication. He would rout the Romans and free the land from foreign domination. The Jews, the religious leaders, were looking for something or someone who did not exist. The Messiah that they awaited was never the intended Messiah of, the, of God. They were looking for a military ruler, someone to destroy their enemies and reestablish them. What they saw in Jesus was not what they were looking for. If you go looking for something that doesn't exist, what are the odds of finding it? Zero. The leaders were snipe hunting. And Jesus told them as much. Do you know what it's like when you ask a question and you don't like the answer that you're given? What is our temptation? My kids, growing up, did this all the time. They would ask their mother a question. Usually her answer was no. Usually my answer was yes, unless I knew that she had already given them the answer no, and then I would just blame her. <laughs> but my kids would ask one of us a question, get an answer that they didn't like and then go to the other one and see if they can get a different answer. It took me a while to learn that game. But my dear wife helped me learn that game very well. <laughs> Honey, if I've already said no, you can't say yes. You would think it would only take one time to learn that. <laughs> took me more than one time to learn that. This is exactly what the Jewish leaders are doing. They keep asking the same question over and over, hoping to get a different answer. We don't like the answer you've given us. Jesus answered them, I told you, and you didn't believe. The works that I do in my Father's name bear witness about me. But you do not believe because you are not among my sheep. See, Jesus said to those gathered, I told you who I was, and I showed you who I was. But you did not believe me. So you're now asking the question, again, over and over and over. Everything that Jesus Christ said and did witnessed to the fact that he was the Messiah for those who were willing to accept it. But these crowds were not willing. Twice Jesus said to them, you do not believe. 
Back in John chapter 5, Jesus said, How can you believe when you seek glory from one another and do not seek the glory that comes from the only God? See, the primary stumbling block to faith in Jesus, both then and now, is not that Jesus' claims are obscure or insufficient, but that people love the glory of men more than they love the glory of God. It's not primarily a problem of knowledge. These leaders weren't asking because they didn't have some mental understanding. They had heard Jesus say over and over and over. They had seen him perform miracle after miracle after miracle. They weren't dumb people. They simply wanted a different answer. It wasn't a problem of knowledge. It was a problem of pride. It takes sheep to know the shepherd. Today is Good Shepherd Sunday. What is it about Jesus that makes him a good shepherd? Over the years as a pastor, one of the most common questions that I've heard asked is this. How can I be sure that I am saved? How can I be sure that I am That's a hard question. It's hard because it's hard to know a man's heart. I'm very careful not to tell people you are saved. If you're born again, you are a sheep. And Jesus tells us about sheep. You can begin to answer that question by putting your life up to the mirror that Jesus holds out for us beginning in verse 27. Jesus says, Well, my sheep hear my voice. Do you recognize the voice of God? Do you recognize the convicting presence of the Holy Spirit? To hear God's voice is to gain direction for our lives. And Jesus said then, And I know them. Jesus says to us, I am a shepherd, and as a shepherd, I know my sheep. I know their struggles. I know their sin. I know when they hurt. I know when they rejoice. And then he said, another thing about my sheep is they follow me. They follow me. That is the essence of the Christian life. When we come to Christ, He gives us ears to hear and a heart that wants to follow. The essence of the Christian life is relationship. It is a relationship between you and God through the person of Jesus Christ and the active presence of the Holy Spirit. As in any relationship, there is a give and a take. There's the sharing of love and laughter. There's the communication of hope and peace and joy. It is a relationship on our part of submission to one who loves us more than we can imagine and who cares for us perfectly. In verse 26, John says, You do not believe, John writes what Jesus said, You do not believe, because you are not of my sheep. Listen to what the Lord says and what he doesn't say. He doesn't say, you are not my sheep because you do not believe. What he says is, you do not believe because you are not my sheep. See, something must happen to us before we believe. Something must happen to us which turns our heart and gives us a willingness to follow the Good Shepherd. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed that you should go and bear fruit and that your fruit should remain. 
God has to move in our hearts to give us a heart that's willing to follow. See, the essence of relationship is to love the things that the one that we are in relationship with loves. To have a relationship with Jesus is to learn to love the things that he loves. And then at the end of this section, Jesus communicates to these leaders, these Jews, the wonderful end game of this relationship that he has with those who are his. Jesus gives us life eternal. He says about his sheep, he says, I give them eternal life. It is God who gives. God is the giver. He says they will never perish. It is God who holds us and sustains us during the difficult seasons of our life. He says no one will snatch them out of my hand. It is God who holds us. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all. No one is able to snatch them out of the Father's hand. Folks, if you don't hear anything else, please hear this this morning. It is not about how well we hold on to Him, although that is important. But what really matters in life is about how well He holds on to us. He holds us and never lets us go. Eternal life is not about us getting it right. It's about a merciful and gracious God coming down in the person of Jesus Christ, dying on a cross, and buying us. Do you remember the question that started this conversation this morning? Jesus, how long will you keep us in suspense? If you are the Christ, tell us plainly. And then Jesus says this at the end of this section, I and the Father are one. That's the answer to the question. That's the answer. All of this that has happened, all that I have told you is true because I and the Father are one. All that I have shown you is true because I and the Father are one. To know Jesus Christ is to know Jehovah God. Jesus is indeed the Messiah. He had told them and shown them that plainly, plainly, over and over. He is the Redeemer, the hope of the world. John Piper, when preaching on this section some 30 years ago or so, closed his sermon with this illustration. He said, I close now with a scene from your life. It is the hour of your dying. You're in the hospital. It's the middle of the night. Your best beloved has fallen asleep from exhaustion on the chair beside your bed. Long ago you had heard the voice of the Lord and you obeyed him and you followed him in faith. But now a storm begins to rage as Satan throws all his final force against your faith. You feel the reality of eternity like you have never felt it before. The wind of doubt and the waves of fear lash your soul. And then by the grace of God there comes a scene and it's your scene. You are in a boat in a storm and Jesus is approaching you on the water and on his face there is no fear 
with his hair and his cloak flying in the wind. He stops a short way off and stands with his strong hands relaxed at his side in sovereign peace. And from the boat with one last heart-rending glance at your beloved asleep in the chair, you say, Christ, bid me come. And he says, come. And you begin to walk on the water. But then in the final instant, you are utterly overwhelmed with what is happening. I am dying. I am dying. The water is so deep. It is dark. It is cold. It is filled with hideous creatures. For fear, you begin to sink. But the promise of Jesus never fails. And with a mighty hand, he seizes your arm and pulls you to himself. The storm ceases, and there is a great, beautiful calm upon the sea, and it is over. And you know, like you never imagined you could know, that Jesus is precious because he has given you eternal life. It is in the relationship with him that we build in this life that he prepares us for the journey to the next. The answer to the question asked on that winter's day on Solomon's porch is still the same. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He said this to us, I am the good shepherd, and the good shepherd lays down his life for his sheep. The Easter message continues. Will you follow him? In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.